from the RSNA. This is the Radiology Artificial Intelligence Podcast. My name is Paul Yi, and I'm a radiologist at the University of Maryland and the host of the podcast. On today's episode, we'll be interviewing two guests who come from outside of the radiology communities in internal medicine and pediatrics and discussing a recent American Medical Informatics Association position paper titled Defining Amy as Artificial Intelligence Principles. From this, we'll be discussing ethics and artificial intelligence. Our guests are two of the study authors, the first one being Dr. Christoph Lehman. Dr. Lehman is Willis C. Madry, MD, Distinguished Professor of Pediatrics, Population Data Sciences, and Bioinformatics at the University of Texas Southwestern, where he directs the Clinical Informatics Center. He's also Associate Dean for Clinical Informatics. After receiving his medical degree from Westfalisch Wilhelm Universität in Germany and completing postdoctoral training at Johns Hopkins University, Dr. Lehman went on to found the journal Applied Clinical Informatics, which is devoted to original research on the use of computer automation in the practice of medicine, and for which he has served as editor-in-chief ever since. In 2009, he co-edited Pediatric Informatics, the first textbook on this subject, and has continued to serve in national leadership capacities, including as the first chair of the Examination Committee of the American Board of Preventive Medicine, the Subcommittee for Clinical Informatics and Inaugural Medical Director, of the Child Health Informatics Center for the American Academy of Pediatrics, and numerous other firsts in the field of clinical informatics for pediatrics. From a research perspective, Dr. Lehman focuses on improving clinical information technology and clinical decision support, and is widely regarded as a leader in the field. Our second guest is Dr. John McGreevy. Dr. McGreevy is Associate Professor of Clinical Medicine at the Perlman School of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania, where he's a practicing hospitalist and serves as Associate Chief Medical Information Officer of the University of Pennsylvania Health System. He is a senior fellow at the Institute for Biomedical Informatics, and most recently he helped to found and organize the Penn Medicine Center for Applied Health Informatics. He received his BA, Cornell, an MD from Penn State, followed by a residency in internal medicine at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, where he was also a fellow in clinical medicine at Harvard Medical School. Dr. McGreevy is board certified in internal medicine and clinical informatics, is a fellow of the American College of Physicians, is a certified EPIC physician builder, and is a national leader in clinical informatics, having served three terms on the American Medical Informatics Association, Public Policy Committee, having been a member of multiple AMIA program committees, and currently serves on the AMIA Ethics and Finance Committees, and was recently inducted into the inaugural class of fellows of AMIA. Dr. McGreevy's interests include clinical informatics, clinical decision support, artificial intelligence, health system strategy, governance, and health informatics policy. And so, needless to say, we're very excited to have Drs. Lehman and Dr. McCreevy here on the podcast. Chris and John, thank you so much for joining us here on the Radiology Artificial Intelligence Podcast. It's a pleasure to have you both, especially as colleagues across the aisle, so to speak, in other specialties beyond radiology. Glad to be here. Yeah, delighted to be here. Thanks, Paul, for the invitation. All right, so as the RSNA's Radiology AI Journal, we're used to hosting and interviewing people from the radiology AI community. So it's a real treat to have you both on the podcast as allies from the broader medical informatics community. You both have such interesting backgrounds that span clinical medicine and informatics. So can you tell us about your background and what got you into informatics in general and more recently in AI and machine learning? Thanks, Paul, for having us. And uh, let me start off. Um, for me, informatics just was pure serendipity. I um, was a resident in pediatrics when one of our LAN administrators, uh, administrators um, approached me and said, hey, how about we do a patient simulation? And uh, I uh, worked with him. We did the first web-based natural language uh, using patient simulation. You could type in your question, you know, where does it hurt? Does the pain radiate? And I also played the patient in the photographs. So when I came to an AMIA conference uh, uh, six months later, after we had launched this interactive patient, people in the hallway stopped me and said, oh, I know you. You're the interactive patient. And I thought, well, you know, this computer thing, that might actually have some legs. So that's how I got into that. But when I then really seriously started working in it, I focused on things that improved quality and safety of care. We developed a pediatric TP, uh, parental nutrition calculator. We developed um, uh, things that uh, improved antimicrobial stewardship. 
So uh, uh, I quickly pivoted from education to uh, safety and quality of care using informatics. Yes, thanks, Paul, for the invitation to be here today. I'm delighted to join you on the podcast and, and to join Chris as well. And my story in terms of how I got into informatics began at a prior institution where I work, and we were transitioning to a new lab system, lab information system there. And for example, on Monday, I could look at the lab results for my patient and see rich blood culture result information. So I could see that the blood cultures were positive Four out of four bottles were positive, in fact, and they were growing gram-positive cocci in clusters. And then Tuesday, after the lab information system transition, I looked and the system simply reported blood cultures positive. And a huge amount of clinically important information had been lost in that transition. And I wondered, you know, how many bottles were positive? What did the gram stain show? What was the morphology of the bacteria? And I needed this information as a clinician to determine whether this was a true infection or contamination. Um, and I actually had to call the microbiology lab to report the issue. And they said, wow, you're, you're the first person to report this in our institution. Not even the ID doctors have identified this as an issue. And it made me realize at that moment how much clinicians depend on rich information presented in the right format to make medical decisions. And that without it, we can be lost as clinicians. And it highlighted the importance of presenting clinical information really the right way. And that was my introduction to clinical informatics. And then later I took a position at Penn because the organization was looking for someone who could be a liaison between the IT department and clinicians and someone who could also practice clinically. And then with respect to AI, in my role as an associate CMIO at Penn Medicine, I've been part of conversations over the years about the use of chat bots in clinical practice. And in the course of those discussions, there were conversations about the extent to which chatbots were an appropriate substitute for experienced clinicians in interacting with patients. And that prompted me to write an article with Dr. Bill Hansen and Dr. Ross Capel that was published in JAMA in 2020, outlining 12 key considerations when implementing conversational agents into a healthcare setting. Thanks so much for sharing your backgrounds. I think that it's really resonating with me about getting interested in informatics, just simply looking at some of the pain points that we've had as practicing physicians. You know, although as radiologists, we spend most of our time looking at images, we, believe it or not, we do go into the EMR. We look at things like lab values, maybe even cultures, if we're looking at an imaging study that asks, is there infection? And so I think that that's one part that in our community, we haven't maybe addressed as much or focused on in terms of our research. And you both mentioned AMIA, which you're both part of. Our editor-in-chief, uh, Dr. Chuck Kahn, is also part of that, as well as some of the leading informaticists in radiology, like Dr. Kurt Langlotz. Um, can you tell us a little bit more and our viewers about AMIA? Because I'm actually not as familiar. You know, I'm part of SIM, I'm part of RSNA, but AMIA is one that I've always kind of seen, but not really been as well versed on. So I'd love to hear a little bit about that. Sure, Thank, and thanks for the opportunity. AMIA, or the American Medical Informatics Association, is an organization of about 5,000 professionals uh, that are interested in the application of informatics and medicine. And uh, it's, a, it's a very colorful and broad tribe. Um, I found my uh, peeps in AMIA. Uh, it has uh, people that uh, are interested in applied informatics, like me. Uh, it has uh, nursing informatics, radiology informatics, pharmaco pharmacogenetics informatics. Uh, you uh, have an interest in any kind of informatics from policy to application to evaluation and ethics, you will find uh, uh, people with similar interests in EMEA. So currently, <clears throat> And this pertains to uh, this particular podcast. I'm the uh, co-chair of the ethics working group at AMIA. And uh, that's, uh, you know, an area that uh, uh, is of great interest to me that uh, uh, matters to me tremendously and is important for the society. No, thank you for that overview. I think AMIA sounds like a society and a group that certainly uh, many of... Um, our listeners' alleys and certainly mine. 
And so speaking of um, some of these different fields, AI has been creating a lot of buzz in our field of radiology and other image heavy specialties like optho and pathology. So as physicians who practice in pediatrics and or internal medicine, what's the temperature of AI in your fields? Does the average doctor in your fields think about AI on a regular basis the way many radiologists do? Or is it still more of a kind of fringe topic? And what do those in your fields think about AI? So Paul, I think that's, that's a great question. And I think as an internist, I would say that frankly, there's probably not quite as much buzz in internal medicine as there is in radiology, uh, perhaps anesthesiology and ophthalmology with regard to AI. Um, but there's definitely interest. And I was at the American College of Physicians internal medicine meeting recently, and there was a well-attended session titled Demystifying AI, Clinical Care of the Future. And so, you know, I think that, that word demystifying indicates a level of, of interest in, in understanding what's going on, what does the future hold for our field in internal medicine. And in that session, the speakers made a point that I think Chris and I have made with our colleagues in our discussions on the AMIA Public Policy Committee um, and perhaps within the AMIA Ethics Committee as well. And, and that is that AI should be applied to solve defined clinical problems rather than the other way around. That is, AI should not be developed in a vacuum with the hope that there might be a good clinical use for it one day. Um, AI should not need to go searching for a practical application. It should be the clinicians who define a need and then see if there is a, a way for the AI to be applied in that situation. And I think as a hospitalist, there are some applications of AI that strike close to home. For example, AI systems that could better predict patients who are at risk of readmission might be useful so that we could dedicate additional resources to avoiding that undesirable outcome. And even better, I think, would be systems that could advise interventions that are likely to be effective in preventing readmission, since identifying what actually works to prevent readmissions remains a challenge across the country. So I'm, I'm a little bit biased when it comes to um, AI and its penetration into real life. Um, and that's not because I'm a pediatrician and uh, pediatricians tend to be conservative and careful and uh, reluctant uh, to uh, jeopardize um, uh, you know, their patients just because a fancy new technology is available. But uh, I'm the editor of a journal called Applied Clinical Informatics. And for every 30 papers I get that uh, say, hey, look at this new cool AI model that we've built. Uh, I get one maybe that says, hey, we took this AI model and actually implemented it in care and evaluated it. So there's a big gap between the theoretical aspects of this current work and what really reaches patient care. And as long as that gap is narrowed, uh, we, uh, we are far from actually um, applying this technology and reaping its benefits. Yeah, I think that's well said, this gap between uh, theory and practice or theory and implementation as you're talking about. I think it's something that probably affects every technology that gets developed in medicine, right? I mean, when we look back to things like even the digital imaging record in the PACS, um, in radiology, there's this movement called hashtag ditch the disc, which is kind of crazy, but basically um, the, st the standard of care right now, state of the art, is if you want to get your images, your MRI, your CT scan, transfer from hospital A to hospital B or clinic A to B, you've got to get a CD or a DVD. And I don't know about you, I don't even have a CD-ROM reader anymore, so I don't <laughs> even know how that works. Um, I like I used to have an office at Hopkins where I would decorate the ceiling with CD-ROMs. You know, a lot of them were AOL uh, CDs, uh, you know, where you install our software, but uh, a few of them were uh, digital images as well, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so talk about a blast from the past. We're still using them in 2022. So I'm wondering, in your experience collectively over the past 20 plus years, you've seen the field grow of informatics with new technological developments such as the EMR, maybe the PACs, and most recently with AI. So from your perspective, all of these trials and tribulations we're seeing, Chris, as you mentioned, with this gap between theory and actual practice and others, is it really that much different um, compared to past waves in technology and medicine? 
And if not, how is it different, especially with regards to how we should be thinking about its use in clinical care? That, that's a great question. Um, you, uh, you're probably familiar or your uh, listeners are familiar with uh, Chuck Friedman's um, statement that uh, human and computer are better than human alone. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I fully subscribe to this. And I think uh, this is a technology that is going to propel us. But at the same time, I'm always leery uh, when it comes to implementing new technology and the effects uh, that it may have uh, on patient care. Um, you know, when you board a plane, there's still pilots on board, right? And it's not that planes can't take off by themselves, planes can fly by themselves, planes can land by themselves. So we don't, but so what do we still have the pilot in there for? Uh, the pilot is not there because of union regulations. The pilot is there because machines are terrible in dealing with unforeseen events. Uh, the blue screen of death, uh, that is the reason why we still have pilots in the uh, cockpit. Uh, humans are great in dealing with events that are unpredicted, that are unforeseen, and can wiggle them out, themselves out of many terrible situations. So when it comes to AI, um, the worry that I always have that oftentimes it's implemented as a black box technology. You don't really know what goes in and what uh, comes out and how that is generated. And I've been working for 20 some years in decision support. One of the basic principles of doing decision support is show your work. Let the user understand how you derive from an input to a recommendation show your input because that allows the user to validate you know is the input correct is the conclusion correct and should i really truly apply this uh, recommendation and uh in ai we have unfortunately worked um because a part of it because of its, its complexity we've worked with a lot of black box uh technology and uh for me as a practicing physician who has concerns about the safety uh, of his patients, I worry about this. So I think it's slightly different than past technology waves because it's so much uh, more technology that's behind the veil that an average user doesn't necessarily uh, can uh, penetrate and understand. I, I love that idea of showing your work uh, as someone who has a uh seventh grader and uh, who helps you with math homework, <laughs> showing your work is, is super important, of course. Um, and, and I couldn't agree with Chris more. And, I, I, Chris, and I, I think that I really appreciate that you brought up the fundamental theorem of Friedman. That was something I had been thinking about too. Uh, I, again, just restated that the, the goal of informatics is that the computer plus the human is more effective at completing a task than the human alone. Um, and it's this idea that the computer is augmenting human capabilities, not replacing them. Um, and it's the, an idea that computers should um, not replace human capabilities, at least for now, and that may change in the future. Um, but in answer to your question, Paul, I, I think this feels a bit different to me as well. I think there have been many technological tools historically that were there to save time and labor on the part of clinicians and to improve patient safety, to improve patient outcomes. You can think about in, for purposes of this podcast, advanced MRI imaging, robotic assisted surgeries, and, and even now third generation left ventricular assist devices. These are devices that are the size of a D battery and that have frictionless motors and they're magnetically levitated. And in so doing, they can reduce shearing and thrombosis risks. Um, and amazingly, these technologies have a one year survival of about 81% now after implant implantation. Um, and, and all these technologies historically were there to assist clinicians and patients, but it's hard to think of one of these technologies historically that crossed the boundary into making clinical decisions for clinicians um, and driving the care that patients receive. And AI technologies in medicine are still early in their development, but they're getting better. And the real question will be, will they be used to support and augment clinician decision-making or ultimately replace it? So as we talk about these different considerations of AI and how it is different from past technological waves, I'm reminded of something from, uh, from my high school days from the movie iRobot. 
um, it's based on the novel um, by Isaac Asimov, where there are these three principles of robotics. You know, one of them is like a robot shall not injure a human or through inaction allow a human to be harmed. And I think that's really interesting now in this day and age where we're talking about AI, we're talking about robotics, self-driving cars, et cetera, et cetera. And it seems like there ought to be some set of principles or some set of guiding kind of rules for AI. And incidentally, uh, you both recently co-authored an AMIA position paper titled Defining AMIA's Artificial Intelligence Principles. And in this, you outline a framework to think about how to create and govern AI in healthcare in ethical and responsible ways with principles that are not so unlike Asimov's principles. And so this framework is based on the well-known Belmont principles of autonomy, beneficence, non-maleficence, and justice. So can one of you walk us through this framework that you present and give us a summary of the principles in this paper for the benefit of our listeners and those of us working with AI, either in research or clinical care? I'd like to defer to the senior author on the paper. All right, John, thank okay. you. Uh, so uh, first of all, um, unfortunately, um, I have to point out to you that AI has been used uh, to do terrible things already in the past. Uh, AI has been used uh, to uh, blackmail people. AI has been used to commit crimes. So um, and Asimov's uh, principles, unfortunately, have not in the past been applied universally to AI. And uh, you know, our paper uh, really realized that um, there is um, significant risk to patient, there's risks to providers, and uh, there's risk to society when you use AI. So we went back to the uh, Belmont principles and uh, evaluated how they applied to AI and actually extended them as well. So the basic principles generally for the development of AI includes autonomy, so, which really says that an AI, an AI system must protect the autonomy of all people and treat them with courtesy and respect, including the, uh, the facilitation of informed consent. So, um, one of the uh, things that uh, we encounter when it comes to AI in our daily lives uh, includes the uh, robocalls that you receive, where fake human being, uh, at least that's how it's perceived, ask you to just talk to them about uh, some kind of thing that they're trying to sell. For most people, it's unclear whether this person is a bot or whether this person is a real life human being. So the principle of autonomy, for example, implies that you cannot have a machine pretend to be a human person. Uh, so the Turing uh, test always must fail for the application of AI in uh, medicine. And humans have to be aware of that. The next principle is beneficence. So AI system must be helpful to people uh, and uh, they must be modeled after compassionate, kind and considered human behavior. And that also means that there must be non uh, that there must be non-malfeasance. So AI system, systems should not harm patients or providers or anybody involved in medicine. And they should avoid, prevent, and minimize harm or damage to any of the stakeholders. And they must be just. They must include equity for people in the representation and access to the AI, its data, and its benefits. We will all believe AI has the potential to generate enormous benefits for patients. And that benefit must be available to everybody. We already talked about the issue of explainability, uh, you know, show your work. We also uh, need to be able to interpret what AI is recommend, recommending. So if we don't understand uh, what uh, the recommendation is derived from, what the underlying input and logic is, then it is much less likely to be adopted and uh, responded to, and patients miss out on the potential benefits. Along with the justice, they have to be fair. And one of the biggest problems with AI is uh, if the underlying data is biased, then the decisions, the recommendations won't be fair. We have experiences of um, the Apple credit system giving more credit to husbands than to wives, uh, the um, AI system used by Amazon to hire people, uh, preferring men over women. 
we have seen examples in medicine where the underlying data uh, resulted in African American patients receiving less recommendations uh, for preventive care measures. So fairness is a major underlying principle of AI. And if it's not guaranteed, and if the underlying data are biased or based on biased human decisions, then that principle of fairness is uh, violated. They must be dependable, it's easy to argue, and they must be audible. You know, we must be able to see what recommendations actually were generated based on what data and if these systems actually are functioning as designed. And they must be maintained. You know, AI drifts. Uh, you know, you train the model on data that you currently have available. Uh, your print, your practice in your hospital changes, and the model will no longer be as effective as it was. So uh, AI requires incredibly strict knowledge management rules. And uh, you need to also understand that AI is not easily exportable. So if I create a model in uh, my hospital, that might not necessarily work in your hospital. And understanding this is incredibly important. So those are just the uh, principles for development and running of AIs. But there are also other principles for organizations and specific considerations that need to be considered. So for the organizations that, that develop AI, um, the principle of benevolence is inc incredibly important. That means that you cannot, when you are in healthcare, you cannot put the um, application of AI, um, for example, your uh, income, your revenue, over the benefits to the patients. It has to be transparent. People from the outside need to be able to see not only that you're using uh, AI, but how it's designed and how it's uh, uh, implemented and how you're applying it fairly and uh, evenly with uh, good faith actors. And you have to be accountable. If you apply AI, your organization has to be accountable for the risk uh, that you take by applying it. So mm -hmm. you have to assess it, you have to monitor, you have to measure, and you have to mitigate. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, anybody who complains about the AI system, you need to hear these people and you need to follow up on this and make sure that their complaints are um, and uh, there's some special considerations. You know, if you apply AI to vulnerable uh, populations, uh, people that are already disadvantaged by society, there has to be specific safety rules and there have to be more vigorous redress uh, or opportunities. You have the, opp uh, the opportunity and the um, requirement, if you apply AI, you must do research on it and you need to measure how it performs. And you have to look for inherent dangers as well as the benefits. And you have to use, educate your users. Uh, you know, as I said earlier, no user should be encountering an AI system without actually understanding that this is an AI system. And you have to educate them how AI systems work and how they are being used and why uh, they might br bring benefit to you, but why there also are inherent dangers. So, um, you have an obligation to educate the recipients of the recommendation from your AI. Thanks so much for that. I, and I, I guess I would just add a, a few observations. You, you know, one, when, when you were talking about transparency, I couldn't help but think about the fiduciary responsibility in, in the financial world that, that uh, you know, a financial advisor is acting in the best interest always of the client, putting the client's interest first. And I think that's a critical notion in in thinking about how to govern AI as well for healthcare organizations. A couple other things I, I would say that certainly I'm, I'm biased, so I, I might be violating one of the principles of our own paper here, but, but I do think this, this paper sets out one of the most comprehensive lists of uh, principles for the governance and, and oversight of AI that I've seen to date. So it, it's work that I'm really proud of and, and proud to be a part of and um, and grateful to Chris and, and to Tony for inviting me to participate in this effort. And I think, again, just to go back to something that we said in the beginning, that this technology is a little bit different from, from prior technologies in medicine. And as we say in the paper, we can't yet understand nor fully imagine the extent and the effect that AI will have on society, on culture, on, on laws, and on medical practice. And so that's what makes it so important 
to establish these principles and, and some way of governing this new technology in the in the very beginning. I, I want to add one thing that uh, this paper really doesn't touch upon. Yeah, and uh, that's the topic of um, developing new knowledge. You know, this was brought home to me by the target exam. I don't know how many of you rem uh, remember this uh, a while back, an angry father um, wrote to Target, the um, retail organization, and complained that his 16-year-old daughter was receiving advertisements that were directed towards pregnant women. And uh, well, you know, a little while later, uh, he actually learned that his daughter was pregnant and Target had figured that out way before the father. So what we learned from this is that Target developed an algorithm that uh, um, identified women who were likely to be pregnant. And uh, um, what I learned from it, what I hadn't been aware of, it might have been something that is available uh, to that, that's knowledge that's common with OBGYN, but I doubt it, is that uh, pregnant women have a heightened sense of smell and that their purchases are focused on things that are either scentless or lower uh, intensity of scent. And uh, that uh, target actually used that to identify uh, women that were potentially pregnant. So there was an opportunity to actually learn something. Uh, I didn't know that, uh, you know, that that was something that happened during pregnancy. I thought it was fascinating, right? So oftentimes we are left with AI models that we don't quite, you know, the machine develops the model, but we quite, don't quite understand why these different things that flow into this, these different factors that flow into the model actually determine the outcome. And we have an obligation. I think it's, a, it's, a, it's an obligation to science and it's also a moral obligation to actually dig into those models and try to understand how did they derive at that conclusion? Because it's an opportunity to learn something. Uh, it's an opportunity to actually add this to the common knowledge. So um, you develop an AI model. I believe your paper should contain a story that it interprets this model. Why does it model arrive where, uh, at the conclusion that it does? So I think, you know, we didn't touch upon that in the paper we are discussing today, but I think that's actually an, another requirement that I would like to add in the future. I think all of that is super interesting and there's so much to unpack. You know, as we talked about, there's just from these four principles, there's so many nuances. And one thing that's dawning on me is just how these concepts kind of overlap and kind of introduce complexities that I hadn't even thought about. For instance, this idea of autonomy, you know, we often think about it like, oh, well, AI just kind of drive themselves on the road. But it's also in this idea of humans, everyone having um, agency to make their decisions for their life, what is, you know, the right type of care for them. Um, we talk about informed consent. But one thing that dawns on me is even this notion of what is the quote unquote right thing that's going to depend on each individual, right? Like, that's why we even have things like um, advanced directives, because someone might say, I want, if I'm close to dying, I want everything thrown at me. I want to get resuscitated. I want all of the life-saving measures. And other might say, well, I'm okay with that, not going through that. And so I wonder um, if this framework might suggest that in addition to a lot of these technical kind of uh, considerations, um, should we be engaging stakeholders who might not have any interest or any knowledge or experience at all with the technical components, but who are nonetheless key stakeholders, whether that be a patient, whether that be a physician who is rendering these treatments, because, you know, in our world in radiology, I talk to colleagues a lot and, you know, I think they're interested in AI, especially as it becomes used clinically, but they often say like, hey, Paul, I don't know anything about AI. I don't know anything about coding or research, but I would suggest that, you know, everyone has a role to play here. And as we're talking about, probably something that's a lot more important than we might realize at um, face value. But I'm curious if you have any thoughts on that regard. I, I think in this 
paper, Paul, we've outlined that there are a tremendous number of stakeholders to your point and, and patients are very clearly a, a critical stakeholder in this field, just as clinicians are and you can think about other stakeholders as well. So AI developers, professional societies, uh, governments, regulatory agencies, academic institutions. And so I think that one of the exciting things about this field is that there's tremendous energy and attention to AI and medicine right now. And, and I think the road ahead will involve bringing these uh, stakeholders together to, to understand what does a framework that's practical look like and, and how can we apply some common standards to AI systems so that we can level the playing field and, and make sure that, that these systems are safe and effective and equitable in terms of how they how they handle information and, and how they help patients. And Paul, you, you bring up something really, really important. And uh, what you bring up is that the choice of outcomes very some tremendously among individuals. AI models are trained for one particular outcome. You know, it could be survival, reduction of readmissions. Uh, it could be cost efficiency. They are trained for one and one only uh, purpose. So it will deliver that result. Whether that result is the one that the patient wants is a totally other Ball game, right? I, yes. you might have trained a model to maximize survival, and that might come at the cost of me being um, having both my legs amputated. And that might be such a horrible outcome in my mind that I'd prefer to die instead of having both legs amputated. So, training an AI model for one particular outcome doesn't mean that that model should be applied to everybody. Because people have the, the right to be autonomous in choosing the outcomes that they want to target. So one haircut doesn't fit everybody. Uh, so we need to be very, um, very aware of that, that just because we can uh, uh, optimize one particular outcome, that that might not be the one that is desirable to that particular patient. And to pick up on Chris's point there, I, I think I, I agree completely. And I think it's important to not forget that we are still practicing clinicians and we need to continue to exercise clinical judgment in the use of AI data, because that's what it is. It's, it's one piece of data among many that we as clinicians experience and, and use to help make decisions with our patients and, and on behalf of our patients. And I think in that sense, we need to put AI data into clinical context for a particular patient in terms of what their values are and what their hopes and aspirations may be. And ask the question, is this information, AI data or otherwise, is it helpful to my patient? In addition, I would say that going back to Paul, your question about some of the overlap in these principles, I, I do think there is overlap and I think that's okay. I think that's Again, it's a comprehensive list of principles that we invite others to review and, and to consider in terms of establishing a framework for the appropriate governance of AI systems in the future. And I think just for example, for the practice of autonomy, we're talking about allowing individuals to make informed, independent decisions about their health. And, and to me, autonomy requires some of the other principles in our list. So it requires that individuals are well-informed and to do that, they need transparency, they need explainability, they need interpretability. Um, so, so a lot of these principles relate to one another and, and inform and uh, become dependencies for the others. Thanks for sharing those thoughts. I think it's all really well said and there's so much we could talk about. I mean, we could probably be here for five hours digging through everything, but one topic I do want to focus on a little bit more is fairness and bias. And this is one that you've brought up in our conversation today, certainly in the paper. And just to give some context to our listeners, AI algorithms have been shown to harbor or exhibit biases that disadvantage underrepresented or historically underprivileged groups. For example, a recent paper published in Nature Medicine 
show that deep learning models for chest x-ray diagnosis systematically underdiagnosed and had biases against racial minorities. So I'm curious, from your perspective as luminaries in informatics, um, having really studied not just the technical aspects, but really the societal and ethical aspects, why do you think biases are showing up in these AI algorithms? Aren't they supposed to be objective evaluators of disease, literally mathematical equations, as some proponents of AI have posed? Well, you know, you get out what you put in. And, uh, you know, it's the old um, issue of garbage in, garbage out. The, unfortunately, um, we are living in a world that is full of bias. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I don't need to bring up uh, uh, examples in policing, uh, housing, or mortgage for you to understand that uh, we live in a society that is biased. Uh, that uh, treats um, certain people uh, differently than others. And uh, as a result of that, we have data that we train AI algorithms on that are fundamentally flawed. Um, if you train an AI algorithm on data that are influenced by my or your personal bias, then that's what this AI algorithm will deliver. You know, they will deliver exactly what you put in. So it is really incredibly important and it's our obligation to minimize the bias that goes into these systems. And, uh, you know, we, um, let's do one concrete example. Um, many, many years ago, but I don't know, 25, 30 years ago, uh, I wrote a, bio, a paper about uh, chest pain in the emergency room and how women are being treated differently than men. And uh, if you take the bias of the treatment, that, you know, that's inherent in the treatment decisions of ED physicians, then uh, and train an AI model in it, you will get AI recommendations that are less likely to work up women for a heart attack than uh, you will see men. And, uh, you know, until we fix the underlying uh, treatment decision biases that we have as human, and let's face it, I mean, that's incredibly hard and it's a really long-term process, we will not have AI systems that are bias-free. Uh, you know, the, this bottom line, I think this, the, the, the conclusion is AI systems will be just as flawed as we are, just more efficient. I, I concur. I, I would say that AI systems are only as good and as fair and as just as, as the humans who design them. And, uh, and we, we know from the seminal work from, from Obermeyer in Science in 2019 that uh, there, there was clear bias described there in that paper where part of the problem was that healthcare costs were used as a proxy for healthcare needs and severity of illness. But clearly we know that some people have less access to care and can't spend as much money on care because of, as Chris described, the systemic and structural factors in our society. And that doesn't mean that those individuals are less sick or less uh, worthy of, of receiving care. And I think that the Obermeyer uh, paper and, and Obermeyer's colleagues really put a, a great light on that problem and this was a seminal work in identifying some of the biases that these AI systems can produce. So we, we need to be attentive to that. And I think in our paper that we've been discussing today, we've, we've done our best to be attentive to some of those, those risks. Um, I, I think that Chris has already described another risk of AI systems. It's, it's not just a mathematical equation. Chris has described how the training population may not equal the population that the model is actually used on in clinical practice. So an AI model that's trained on an urban population in Boston, does that model still work if it's used to help a population in rural Texas? I, I don't know. It, that deserves some, some discussion. And will that AI system provide erroneous guidance if it is used on a different population and transferred there? Chris also mentioned the risk of drift. Is the AI system changing over time? And, and who is watching its evolution? That's a point that we try to make very clearly in our paper, the, the need for oversight, for accountability, for ongoing management of the knowledge system. Who's watching that system and making sure that 
uh, it's continuing to be safe and effective. And with that, I would say that, as we point out in the paper, one of the terms that's been coined is algorithm of vigilance, uh, but by our colleague Peter Emby, and, and that is a nod to this notion that these systems aren't just something that you deploy and walk away from and say it's done. They need ongoing monitoring and support and reevaluation to make sure that they're still performing as designed and, and performing in a way that's effective and, and safe and equitable. I, I think that's all incredibly well said. And clearly this will be a topic that we as a profession, not just in radiology or in internal medicine or pediatrics, but as a whole in medicine, I think along with data science, computer science um, needs to really dig into in the coming years. And you know, I, for one, look forward to our societies and our professions coming together to help solve it. But as we get into the last minutes of our time together, I want to end on a maybe a more optimistic note. Um, so this is a question we pose to all of our guests, and that is, what are you most excited about for the next decade in AI and healthcare or informatics in general? I am excited about uh, the fact that AI offers novel ways of uh, making our care safer, more efficient, and more effective. I am realistic at the same time that it will require a lot of work, a lot of vigilance, and uh, that we will make mistake, uh, mistakes along the way. But I believe that uh, the things that we already taken for granted in our daily lives, uh, decision support when we do banking, decision support when we do investments, decision support then, uh, that help us uh, select the right uh, items for our online shopping cart, that uh, these things uh, will make their way into medicine and will lead to a better experience for patients. I'm getting at that age you know, where um, you know, I'm turning into a patient, you know, uh, as we all get older, our lives gets more interesting because you don't know in the morning what's going to hurt. Uh, so uh, as I'm transitioning from a role of a provider to a patient, I am looking forward to take advantage of this. So, uh, and um, with that, I want to say I want AI systems that are kinder and kinder and gentler than they currently are. And I hope we'll focus our attention on that going forward. I, I'm excited, Paul, because there's a lot of attention to this topic, as I mentioned earlier. And there are a lot of people who are committed to getting AI and medicine right. And these are individuals who are working to lay the right foundation for AI that is, again, as we've talked about, safe, effective, and equitable. And I'm looking forward to a future where with careful advanced planning, development of standards, systems, and, and oversight, we can experience equitable AI in healthcare. And where we have a system um, where there are not haves and have nots in terms of access to these novel and, and promising technologies as they get better and better, but where there is widespread access to them to promote human health. And I'm optimistic that we can achieve some of the goals that we've set out in this paper of autonomy, beneficence, and justice. Um, and I, you know, I'm optimistic that we can create a level playing field as well, because I think that one of the things we need to do is, is recognize that there needs to be ongoing research and innovation in this space to make these tools better over time. And so I'm hopeful that we can create that level playing field that, that enables innovation at the same time that we provide appropriate monitoring and oversight of these technologies so that they're used fairly and justly in practice to improve the lives of people, whether those are patients or clinicians. And I think lastly, my, my hope or my optimism is that clinicians will define and drive the use cases for AI and their technologies. Um, the clinicians will be in the lead to identify clinical challenges that conventional tools have not solved. And, and that those clinicians will be positioned to ask the question, could an AI technology help to meet this particular challenge? And I think if we keep that mindset front of mind, I, I think that we'll be in a good position to leverage these technologies for good and for, for useful purposes in the future. Thanks for sharing those things that you're excited about, uh, John and Chris. Again, it's been a pleasure to have you here on the Radiology Artificial Intelligence Podcast. Thanks for sharing 
the overview of these principles for AI, um, which I think is going to be a tremendous help as we forge ahead with this uh, future that both of you have laid out. So again, thanks for your time. and really appreciate having you here. Thank you for having us. Thank you, Paul. Thank you for tuning in to the Radiology AI podcast. We'll be back next month. Be on the lookout for episodes like this and other content coming down the pipeline. If you like what you heard, please subscribe to us on Spotify, Apple, or wherever you get your podcasts. Please also follow us on Twitter at radiology underscore AI. And if you have a topic or person you'd like us to cover on the podcast, email us at podcasts at rsna.org. Mm-hmm.